Hello and welcome to the fourth lesson in our course, Theories of Personality. Now, this man right here is Alfred Adler, an Austrian uh, physician and psychiatrist who is best known for forming the school of thought known as individual psychology. So, he, uh, he also had an important influence on many other great thinkers including that of Abraham Maslow, Karen Hornay, and uh, Albert Ellis. So, Adler was initially a colleague of Sigmund Freud and he helped establish psychoanalysis and uh, was a founding member of the Vienna Psychoanalytic Society. In fact, when people inquired about Adler's early relationship with Freud, he would always show an old postcard containing Freud's invitation to Adler to join Freud and three other physicians to meet at Freud's home the following Thursday evening, in which clo uh, Freud closed the invitation saying, with hearty greetings as your colleague. Uh, however, as noted by Feist and Feist, their warm association came to a bitter ending with both of them hurling caustic remarks at each other. During the um, acrimonious breakup between the two men, Freud even accused Adler of having paranoid delusions and of using terrorist attacks. So he told one of his friends that uh, the revolt by Adler was that of an abnormal individual driven mad by ambition. Of course, Alfred Adler was not a terrorist nor a person driven by mad ambition. In fact, his individual psychology presents an optimistic view of people while resting heavily on a feeling of openness with all humankind. In addition to Adler's more optimistic look at people, several other differences made the relationship between Freud and Adler quite uh, 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 tenuous. First, Freud reduced all motivations to sex and aggression, whereas Adler, like Hume, thought that sex and aggression are not the only source of motivation. Adler saw uh, people as being motivated mostly by social influences and by their striving for either superiority or success. Second, Freud assumed that people have little or no choice in shaping their personality. Whereas Adler believed that people are largely responsible for who they are and what they do. Third, Freud's assumption that, uh, present, beha that present behavior is caused by past experiences was directly opposed to Adler's notion that present behavior is shaped by people's view of the, fu uh, of the future. And, and, and fourth, in contrast to Freud, who placed very heavy emphasis on unconscious components of behaviors, Adler believed that psychologically healthy people are usually aware uh, of what they are doing and why they are doing it. As noted earlier, Adler was an original uh, of the Wednesday Psychology Society. However, when uh, theoretical and personal differences between Adler and Freud emerged, Adler left uh, the Freudian circle and established an opposing theory which became known as individual psychology. So in this video, we are going to talk about the life and works of Alfred Adler. We'll, we will finish it with a critique of Adler's theory by looking into his concept of rea uh, humanity. So Alfred Adler was born on February 7, 1870 in uh, Rudolfsheim, a, a village near Vienna. His mother, Pauline, was a hard-working homemaker who kept busy with her seven children, and his father, Leopold, was a middle-class uh, Jewish grain merchant from Hungary. So, as a young boy, Adler was weak and uh, sickly, and at the age of five, he nearly died of pneumonia. He had gone ice skating with an older boy who abandoned him. Cold and shivering, uh, he, or Adler, managed to find his way home where he immediately fell asleep on the living room couch. As Adler gradually gained consciousness, he heard um, a doctor say, say to his parent, Give yourself no more trouble, this boy is lost. This experience, along with the death of a younger brother, motivated Adler to become a physician. So, uh, Adler's poor health 
was in sharp contrast to that uh, to the health of uh, of his older brother Sigmund, uh, and several of his um, Adler's uh, earliest memories were concerned with unhappy competition between his brother's good health and his own illness. Sigmund Adler, uh, the childhood rival whom Adler attempted to surpass, remained a worthy opponent and in later years, he became a very successful uh, businessman and even uh, helped Adler financially. So, by almost any standard, however, Ad Alfred Adler was much more famous than Sigmund Adler. Like many second-born children, however, Adler continued uh, the rivalry with his older brother into, the mi into middle age. So, uh, the lives of Freud and Adler have several interesting parallels. Although both men came from middle or lower uh, middle class Viennese Jewish uh, parents, uh, neither was devoutly religious. However, Freud was much more conscious of his Jewishness than was Adler and often believed himself to be uh, persecuted because of his, of his Jewish background. On the other hand, Adler uh, never claimed to have been mistreated and in 1904, while still a member of Freud's inner circle, he converted to Protestantism. Uh, despite his conversion, he held no deep religious convictions and in fact, one of his uh, biographers regarded him as an as agnostic. Now, like Freud, Adler had a younger brother, a younger brother who died in infancy. This early experience profoundly affected both men in vastly different ways. Freud, by his own account, was or had wished unconsciously for the death of his rival. And when the infant died, um, Freud was filled with guilt and uh, self-reproach. Conditions that continued into his adulthood. In contrast, Adler would seem to have a more powerful uh, reason to be traumatized by the death of his younger brother, uh, Rudolf. You see, at the age of four, Adler awoke one morning to find Rudolf dead in the bed next to his. Rather than being terrified or, or feeling guilty, Adler saw this experience, along with his own near-death uh, uh, from pneumonia, as a challenge to overcome death. So, uh, thus at the age of five, he decided that his goal in life would be to conquer death. Because medicine offered some chance to, to forestall death, Adler decided at that early age to become a physician. So, although Freud was surrounded by a large family, including seven uh, younger brothers uh, and, and sisters, two grown half-brothers and a nephew and a niece, um, about his age, he felt more emotionally attached to his parents, especially or primarily to his mother, uh, than these other family members. In contrast, Adler was more interested in social relationships, and his siblings, uh, and, and, and actually peers, played a pivotal role in his childhood development. Personality differences between Freud and Adler continued throughout adulthood, with Freud uh, preferring intense one-to-one -one relationship and Adler feeling more comfortable in groups uh, in group situation. So these personality differences were also reflected in their professional organizations. Freud's Vienna Psychoanalytic Society and International Psycho Psychoanalytic Association were highly structured in pyramid fashion with an inner circle of six of Freud's trusted friends forming a kind of oligarchy at the top. Adler, by comparison, was a more uh, democratic individual, often meeting with colleagues and friends in Vienna, uh, coffee houses where they played the piano and sang songs. Adler Society of Individual Psychology, in fact, suffered from a loose organization and Adler had a relaxed attitude towards business details that did not enhance his movements. So Adler attended elementary school with neither difficulty nor distinction. However, when he entered the gymnasium in, in preparation for medical school, he did so poorly that his father threatened to remove him from school and apprentice him to shoe 
making. So as a medical student, he once again completed or uh, he completed work with no special honors, probably because his interest in patient care conflicted with his professor's interest in precise diagnosis. When he received his medical degree near the end of 1855, 1895 rather, uh, he had realized his childhood goal of becoming a physician. So because his father had been born in, in, in Hungary, uh, Adler was a Hungarian citizen and was thus obliged to serve a tour of military duty in the Hungarian army. He fulfilled that obligation immediately after receiving his medical degree and then returned to Vienna for postgraduate study. So Adler became an Austrian citizen in 1911. So he began private practice as an eye specialist, but gave up uh, that spe specialization and turned into psychiatry and general medicine. Now, scholars disagree on the first meeting of Adler and Freud, but actually all agree that uh, in the late fall of 1902, Freud invited Adler and three other Viennese physicians to attend a meeting in Freud's home to discuss psychology and uh, neuropathology. Remember the invitation in the postcard which Adler would show people around? So this is the same invitation that we are talking about. So this group was known as the Wednesday Psychological Society in 1908 when it became the Vienna uh, Psychoanalytic Society, although Freud uh, led these discussion groups. Adler never considered Freud to be his mentor and actually believed uh, somewhat uh, naively that he and others could make contributions to psychoanal psychoanalysis, contributions that would be accepted, uh, acceptable to Freud. So, uh, so uh, around this time, along with nine other former members of the Freudian circle, he formed the Society of Free Psychoanalytic uh, Study. So, uh, like Freud, uh, Adler was affected by events surrounding World War I. Both men had financial difficulties and both reluctantly borrowed money from relatives. Freud from his brother-in-law uh, Edward Bernays and Adler from his brother Sigmund. So uh, each man also made important changes in his theory. Freud elevated aggression to the level of sex after viewing the horrors of war and Adler suggested that social interest and compassion could be the cornerstone of human motivation. So the war years also brought a major disappointment to Adler when his uh, application for, 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 uh, for an unpaid lecture position at the University of Vienna was turned out, was turned down. Adler wanted his or this position to gain another forum for spreading his views, but he also desperately desired to attain the same uh, prestigious position that Freud had held for more than a dozen years. So Adler never attained this position, but after the war, he was able to advance his theories through lecturing, establishing child guidance clinics, and uh, training teachers. During the last uh, several years of his life, Adler frequently visited the United States where he taught individual psychology at Columbia University and the New School for Social Research. So by 1932, he was a permanent resident of the United States and held the position of visiting professor for medical psychology at Long Island College of Medicine. Uh, so, so unlike Freud who disliked Americans and their superficial understanding, of, of uh, psychoanalysis, Adler was impressed by Americans and admired their optimism and open-mindedness. His popularity as a speaker in the United States during the mid-1930s had few rivals and he aimed his last several books towards uh, a receptive American market. So, um, Adler married a fiercely independent Russian woman. Uh, Risa Epstein in 19 or in December 18, 19, 1897. So Risa was an early feminist and uh, much more political than her than her husband. In later years, while Adler lived in New York, she remained mostly 
in 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 Vienna and work to promote Marxist Leninist uh, views uh, that were quite different from Adler's notion of individual freedom and 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 and, and responsibility. So after several years of request by her husband to move to New York, Raisa uh, finally came to, to stay in New York only a few months before Adler's death. Ironically, Raisa, who did not share her husband's love for America, continued to live in New York until her own death. Nearly a quarter of a century after Adler had died, uh, had died. So, so Raisa and Adler had four children, Alexandra and Kurt, who became psychiatrists and continued their father's work. Val, uh, Valentine or Valley, who died as a political prisoner uh, of the Soviet Union in about 1942. And Cornelia or Nelly, who, ins who aspired to be an actress. So Adler's favorite relaxation was music. But he also maintained an active interest in art and literature. In uh, his work, uh, he often borrowed examples from fairy tales, the Bible, Shakespeare, Geith, and, and, and numerous other literary works. He identified himself closely with a common person, and his manner and appearance were consistent with that identification. His patients included a high percentage of people from the lower and middle classes and a rarity among psychiatrists of his time. His personal qualities included an optimistic attitude towards the human condition, an intense competitiveness coupled with friendly uh, congeniality, and a strong belief in the, basic gen in, 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 in the basic gender equality, which combined with a willingness to forcefully advocate women's rights. So from uh, middle childhood until after his 67th birthday, Adler enjoyed robust health. Then in the early months of 1937, while concerned with the fate of his daughter, Valley, who had disappeared somewhere in Moscow, Adler felt chest pains while uh, on a speaking tour in Netherlands. So ignoring the doctor's advice to rest, he continued on uh, to Aberdeen, Scotland, where on May 28, 1937, he died of a heart attack. Freud, who was 14 years older than Adler, had outlived his longtime adversary. On, on hearing of Adler's uh, death, Freud, as quoted by Jones in 1957, sarcastically remarked, for a Jew boy out of a, Vienna so a Viennese suburb, a death in Aberdeen is an unheard of career in itself and a proof of how he had uh, got on. So the world really rewarded him richly for his service in having contradicting psychoanalysis. So, uh, so Alfred Adler had a beautiful theory of human personality. So much so that it influenced many succeeding perspectives about the topic. Although Alfred Adler had a profound effect on such later theories as Harry Stack Sullivan, Karen Horney, Julian Rotter, even Abraham Maslow, Carl Rogers, Albert Ellis, Rolly May, and others, his name is less well known than that of either Freud or Carl, or Carl Jung. So, at least three reasons account for this. First, Adler did not establish a tightly run organization to perpetuate his theories. Second, he was not a particularly gifted writer and most of his books were compiled by a series of editors using Adler's, Adler's, uh, Adler's scattered uh, lectures. Third, many of his views were incorporated in the works of such later theorists as Maslow, Rogers, and Ellis, and thus are no longer associated with Adler's name. So with that, let's talk about Adler's individual psychology. Although his writings reveal great insight into the depth and complexities of, of human personality, Adler evolved a basically simple and parsimonious theory. To Adler, people are born with weak, inferior bodies, a condition that leads to feelings of inferiority and a consequent uh, dependence on uh, other people. 
Therefore, a feeling of unity with others, that is, social interest, is inherent in people and the ultimate standard for psychological health. More specifically, the main tenets of Adlerian theory can be stated in an outline form like, uh, like this one. So, uh, this is an adapted for, uh, was adapted from that list and it represents the final statement of individual psychology. So the first dynamic, uh, we can see here that uh, the list goes like the first is that uh, the, the, the one dynamic force behind people's behavior is the striving for superiority or success. We will be talking about that later on. And that people's subjective perception shape their behavior and personality. Third is that personality is unified and self-consistent. Fourth is that the value of all human activity must be seen from the viewpoint of social interest. Five, uh, the self-consistent personality structure develops into uh, a person's style of life. And six is that style of life is molded by people's creative power. So, uh, striving for success or superiority is the first tenet of, of Adlerian theory. It states that uh, the one dynamic force, as we have mentioned earlier, behind people's behavior is the striving for success or superiority. Adler reduced all motivation to a single drive, the striving for success or superiority. Adler's own childhood was marked by physical deficiencies and strong feelings of competitiveness with his older brother. Uh, individual psychology holds that everyone begins with life or everyone begins life with physical deficiencies that activate feelings of inferiority. Feelings that motivate a person to strive for either superiority or success. So, uh, for him, psychologically unhealthy individuals strive for personal superiority. Whereas, psychologically healthy people seek success for all humanity. Early in his career, Adler believed that aggression was the dynamic power behind all motivation. But he soon became dissatisfied with that term. After rejecting aggression as a single motivating force, Adler used the term masculine protest, which implied uh, will uh, to power or, or will power or a domination of others. So, so, however, he soon abandoned masculine protest as a universal drive while continuing to give it a limited role in his theory of abnormal development. Next, Adler called the single dynamic force striving for superiority. So in his final theory, however, he limited striving for superiority to those people who strive for personal superiority over others and introduced the term striving for success to describe actions of people who are motivated by highly developed social interest. Regardless of the motivation for striving, each individual is guided by a final goal. And speaking of which, uh, Adler adapted the concept of fiction from uh, the as if philosophy of Hans uh, Weihinger. Uh, according to Adler, people strive toward the final goal of either personal superiority or the goal of success for all humanity. So remember that uh, psychologically health or rather psychologically unhealthy individuals strive for personal superiority while persons who are psychologically healthy seek uh, success for all humanity. In either case, the final goal is a fictional and has uh, is fictional rather and has no objective existence. Nevertheless, the final goal has great significance because it unifies personality and renders all behaviors comprehensible. So uh, it's actually the product of the creative power. That is, it's our ability to freely shape our behaviors and create our own personality. So by the time uh, children reach four to five years old, uh, four to five years old, their creative power has developed to the point that they can set their final goal. So for others, for Adler, rather, even infants have an innate drive towards growth, completion, or success. 
because infants are small, incomplete, and weak, they feel inferior and powerless. And so, to compensate for this deficiency, they set a fictional goal to be big, complete, and strong. Thus, a person's final goal reduces the pain of inferiority feelings and points that person in the direction of either superiority or success. So, if, chil uh, if children feel neglected or pampered, their goal remains largely unconscious. Conversely, if children experience love and, secure and security, they set a goal that is largely conscious and clearly understood. Adler hypothesized that in striving for their final goal, people create and pursue many preliminary goals. These sub-goals are often conscious, but the connection between them and the final goal usually remains unknown. Furthermore, the relationship among preliminary goals is seldom realized. So, so from the point of view of the final goal, however, they fit together in a self-consistent pattern. So Adler used the analogy of, of, of a playwright who, who builds the characteristics and the subplots of, of, of the play according to the final goal of the drama. It's like when you write, let's say, your Wattpad or, or any story, uh, you may want to have a final uh, goal of the, of the story uh, and you create your characters and, and, and the subplots uh, in accordance with this final goal, with this, with this, uh, with this uh, story. So, uh, when the final scene is known, all dialogues and even subplots acquire new meaning. So, so when an individual's final goal is known, all actions make sense and sub-goals take on new significances. So, if you are, let's say, uh, if you are, let's say, a fan of fiction, you probably, uh, when you start reading cert uh, a certain book or watching, let's say, a new series, you might be asking yourself why, uh, why did a, a particular character act this way or why did... Um, why, why is the, 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 the mood or the tone of the story this manner? And, and, and uh, at the end, uh, at the final act, you would probably realize why all these things are important and they would make sense. And it's beautiful. <laughs> so, uh, uh, for Adler, people strive for superiority or success as a means of compensation for feelings of uh, inferiority or weakness. And they actually believe that all humans are blessed at birth with small, weak, and inferior bodies. Because of this, all infants have a feeling of inferiority and inadequacy immediately as they begin to experience the world. So, these uh, physical deficiencies ignite feelings of inferiority only because people, by their nature, possess an innate tendency towards completion or wholeness. People are continually pushed by uh, the need to overcome inferiority feelings and pulled by the desire for completion. So these early experiences, such as that, um, such as the need to, to, to gain uh, the parents' attention or shape the child's unconscious uh, fictive goals, so they give the child a need to, to, to strive towards rectifying uh, the inferiority, so which is uh, a need to compensate for weakness by developing other strengths. So, so uh, without the innate movements uh, towards perfection, children would never feel inferior, but without feelings of inferiority, they would never set a goal of superiority or success. So the goal then is set as compensation for the deficit feeling. But the deficit feeling would not exist unless a child first possesses a basic tendency towards completion. So, uh, th uh, there are several outcomes that can happen on a child's quest for completion. First, if the child receives adequate nurturing and care, the child can accept his challenges and learn that they can be overcome uh, with hard work. Thus, the child develops normally and, and, and develops the courage to be imperfect. In his final theory, Adler identified two general avenues of striving. 
The first is the socially non-productive attempt to gain personal superiority. The second involves social interest and is aimed at success or perfection for everyone. However, sometimes the process of compensation goes problematic. One way in which this happens is that, uh, uh, is that uh, when the feeling of superiority becomes too intense and the child begins to feel as though he has no control over his surroundings, he will strive very strenuously or very hard for, for, for compensation to the point that uh, compensation is no longer satisfactory. So this culminates in a state of overcompensation where the person or the, or the child focus on meeting his goal uh, is, is, is exaggerated and becomes pathological. For example, Adler in 1917, in one of his writings, used the ancient Greek figure Demosthenes, who had a terrible stutter but ended up becoming the great orator of, of Greece. Here, Demosthenes uh, started off with an inferiority due to his stutter and overcompensated by not just uh, overcoming his stutter but taking up a, profes a profession that would normally be impossible for stuttering. So, uh, overcompensation can lead to the development of, of, of an inferiority complex. This is a lack of self-esteem where the person is unable to rectify his feelings of inferiority. So according to Adler, a hallmark or rather the hallmark of an inferiority complex is that uh, persons are always striving to find a situation in which they excel. So this drive is due to their overwhelming feelings of inferiority. So according to Adler, there are two components of these feelings of inferiority, primary and secondary. Primary inferiority is the original and normal feeling of, infer of, of, of inferiority maintained by an infant. So for Adler, this feeling is productive as it provides motivation for the child to develop. Uh, secondary inferiority, on the other hand, is the inferiority feeling in the adult results. Uh, in the adult results, when uh, when the child develops an exaggerated feelings feeling of inferiority, these feelings in the adult um, are what is harmful, and uh, they comprise the inferiority complex. So uh, there are two forms of inferiority. Uh, but the, only the second form is regarded as the inferiority complex. So, uh, on the other hand, the superiority complex occurs when a person has the need to prove that he is more super, superior than he truly is. Adler pro, uh, provided an example of a child who, uh, uh, with a superiority complex who is uh, impertinent, arrogant, and, and, and pugnacious. So when the child is treated through psychotherapy, it is revealed that the child behaves in this impatient manner because he feels uh, inferior. Adler actually claims that superiority complexes are uh, born out of uh, inferiority complexes. They are one of the ways which a person with an inferiority complex may use a method of escape from his difficulties. So, uh, some people for Adler strive for superiority with little or no concern for others. Their goals are personal ones and, and, and their striving are motivated largely by exaggerated uh, feelings of personal inferiority or the presence of an inferiority complex. Some people create clever disguise for their personal striving and may conscious or consciously uh, hide their self-centeredness behind the cloak of social concern. So uh, this can happen when someone uh, would show an image that they are concerned with other people but in truth they are really just concerned about themselves. Like when people would uh, help other people and then take pictures of themselves helping the other people and upload it on social media. So, um, 
In contrast to people who strive for personal gains are those psychologically healthy people who, as I have mentioned earlier, are motivated by social interest and the success of all humankind. So these healthy individuals are concerned with goals beyond themselves and are capable of helping others without demanding or expecting a personal payoff and are able to see others not as opponents but as people with whom they can cooperate for social benefit. So uh, their own success is not gained at the expense of others but is a natural tendency to move towards completion or perfection. So people who strive for success rather than personal superiority maintains a, a sense of self, uh, of course, but they see daily problems from the view of society's development rather than from a strictly personal vantage point. So their sense of personal worth is tied closely to their contributions to human society. For them, social progress uh, is more important than personal credit. So, uh, uh, a, Tal a Talmudic saying goes that we don't see the th uh, we don't see things as they are. We see them as we are. So this means that our preconceptions can dramatically alter the way we perceive the world. In connection with this, Adler's second tenet states that people's subjective perceptions uh, shape their behavior and personality. People strive for superiority or success to compensate for feelings of superiority. This we have cleared earlier. But the manner in which they strive is not shaped by reality but by their subjective perceptions of reality. That is, by their, uh, by their fictions or, or expectations of the future. Speaking of which, our most important fiction is the goal of superiority or success, a goal we created early in, in our lives and may not clearly understand. This objective fictional final goal guides our style of life, which we'll be talking about later on, and gives unity to our personality. Adler's ideas on, on fictionalism originated, as I have mentioned earlier, from Hans Wein, uh, Hanger's book, uh, The Philosophy of As If. Uh, 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 Weihanger believed that, uh, that fictions are ideas that have no real existence, yet they influence people um, as they really existed. So one example of a fiction might be men are superior to women. Although this notion is a fiction, many people, both men and women, act as if they, uh, it were a reality. A second option or example might be humans have free will uh, that enables them to make choices. Again, many people act as if they and others uh, have a free will and are thus responsible for their free choice. No one can actually prove that free will really exists, yet this fiction guides the lives of, of most of us. Uh, Another example is when Marcos apologists would say that uh, the, the time of Marcos is the golden age of, of the Philippines, even when there are no empirical evidences to support that claim, and there are many uh, evidences that, 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 uh, that support the, the, uh, the opposite of this, that we really, as a nation, plunged uh, into depth. Uh, there are still people who believe that uh, it is the golden age of, of the Philippines. So people are motivated not by what is true, but by their subjective perception of what is true. So uh, it might be true that the Philippines did not go into uh, the golden age, but people are would still choose to believe that uh, we spent the golden age during those times. So, uh, another example might be a belief of an omnipotent God who reward goods, uh, good and, and, and punish evil. Such a belief guides the daily lives of millions of people and helps shape many of their actions. Whether true or false, fictions have a powerful influence on people's lives. 
Adler's emphasis on fiction is consistent with this strongly held, held teleological view of, of, of motivation. Teleology is an explanation of behavior, as we have mentioned before, in terms of its final purpose or, or, or aim. It's the opposite of causality, which considers behavior as a springing from uh, a specific cause. Teleology is usually concerned with future goals or ends, whereas causality ordinarily deals with past experiences that produce some present effects. So uh, Freud's view of motivation was basically causal. He believed that people are driven by past events that uh, activate per, uh, present behaviors. In contrast, Adler adopted a teleological view, one in which people are motivated by present perceptions of the future. As fictions, these perceptions need not be conscious or actually understood. Nevertheless, they uh, bestow a purpose on all people's actions and are responsible for a consistent pattern that runs throughout their life. So, uh, because people begin li a life small, weak, and inferior, uh, they develop a fiction or, or, or belief system about how to overcome these physical deficiencies and become big, strong, and even superior. But even after they attain size, strength, and superiority, they may act as if they are still small, weak, or inferior. Adler insisted that the whole hum human race is actually blessed with organ inferiorities. These physical handicaps have little or no importance by themselves but become meaningful when they stimulate subjective feelings of, super, of, of inferiority which serves as an impetus towards uh, perfection or, or completion which means that uh, we are motivated to complete ourselves, to overcome, to compensate because of these inferiorities. So, Adler emphasized that physical deficiencies alone do not cause a particular style of life. They simply provide present motivation for reaching future goals. So, so, so such motivation, like all aspects of, of personality, is unified and self-consistent, which we will be talking more uh, about here. <laughs> so, uh, the third tenet of, of Adlerian theory is personality is unified and self-consistent. Adler actually stressed uh, his belief that each person is unique and, and, and in indivisible, indivisible that is. Thus, individual psychology insists on the, hu the, 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 the fundamental unity of personality and the notion that inconsistent behavior does not exist. Thoughts, feelings, and actions are all directed towards a single goal and serve a single purpose. When people behave erratically or unpredictably, their behaviors forces other people to be on defensive, to be watchful so as not to be confused with uh, capricious actions. Adler recognizes several ways in which entire persons uh, or uh, entire person operates with unity and and and, and uh, self consistency. The first is through organ dialect. Adler used the term organ dialect or organ jar art jargon or or organ language interchangeably to refer to somatic signs and symptoms that express through veiled. Uh, though veiled an individual's attitudes and opinions. Organ dialect, like other movements of the person, is understood as purposive. That is, whether or not consciously in, uh, consciously in line with the individual's unique law of movement. Through organ dialect, the body's organ speaks a language which is usually more expressive and discloses the individual's opinion more clearly than words are able to do. So the jargon or, or statement made by the organ is unique and its uh, selection is idiosyncratic which means consistent within the individual's particular organ uh, inferiority or the organ's availability as already rehearsed from somat as, uh, symptomatic expressions. 
So, or according to any symbolic meaning the individual has attached to that selected organ. One example of organ dialect might be a man suffering from rheumatoid uh, arthritis in his hands, uh, his stiff and deformed joints voiced his whole style of life. It is as if they cry out, see my deform deformity, see my handicap, you can't expect me to do manual work. We, uh, we, even without an audible sound. So his hands speak of his desire for, for, for sympathy from others. Another example could be two persons may suffer from leg pains that have no basis in organic disease. Uh, the jargon or the dialect of one may be, I can't stand on my own two feet, expressing a conviction that he or she must depend on uh, the help of others to meet life's challenges. While the jargon of the other may be, I can't stand it, declaring an inability to endure a particular pressure or, or, or difficult situation. So as to uh, the symbolic aspect of the symptom, one might discover that a client experiencing heart trouble for which he, there is no medical explanation is experiencing heartbreak. So uh, a second example of a unified personality is the harm harmony uh, between conscious and unconscious actions. Adler defined the unconscious uh, as the part of the goal that is neither clearly formulated nor completely understood by the individual. So, although Adler used the word unconscious, it's different from the unconscious that was postulated by either Freud or Carl Jung. For Adler, the unconscious is the part of the goal that is not very uh, comprehensible for the person. So with this definition, Adler actually avoided a dichotomy between the unconscious and the conscious, which he saw as two cooperating parts of a same, same unified system. Conscious thoughts are those that are understood and regarded by the individual as helpful in striving for success, whereas unconscious thoughts are those that are not helpful. So, social interest is Adler's somewhat misleading translation of his original German term or Jemianschaftsvoll. A better translation might be social feeling or community feeling, but Jemianschaftsvoll is actually a meaning that is not fully expressed by any English word or actually phrase. Roughly, it means a feeling of oneness with all humanity. It implies membership in the social community of all people. It is fund it's a fundamental sense of being one amongst other people uh, as a fellow human being. And if you think about it, it's actually close to the Filipino concept of kapwa. In other words, it's a communal feeling based on a recognition that people live in a social context, are integrated or in our integral part of their family, community, humanity, and even cosmos itself, and have a natural necessity to solve social problems and to take social affirmative actions. So Adler believed that a person with a well-developed Jamin Shaftesful uh, strives not for personal superiority but for the perfection for all people in an ideal community. Social interest is the natural condition of the human species and the adhesive that binds society together. The natural inferiority of individuals necessitate their joining together to form a society. Without protecting or protection and nourishment from a father or a mother, a baby would perish. Without protection from the family or clan, our ancestors would have been destroyed by animals that were stronger, more ferocious, or, or, or even uh, human beings that were not... Uh, that were not homo sapiens or endowed with keener sense. So, so social interest, therefore, is a necessity for uh, perpetuating the human species. 
However, social interest is only partially inherent in, in, in adaptive uh, development and needs to be actively cultivated uh, in any individual. Social interest is rooted as potentially in everyone, uh, but it must be developed before it can contribute to a useful style of life. It originates from the mother-child relationship during the early months of infancy, and every person who has survived infant infancy was kept alive by a mothering person who possessed some amount of social interest. Thus, every person has uh, had the seeds of, hum of social interest sown during their early months. Others believe that marriage and parenthood is a task for two. However, the two parents may influence a child's social interest in somewhat different ways. The mother's job is so the mother's job for example is to develop a bond that encourages the child's mature social interest and foster a sense of cooperation the father uh, is a second important person in a child's social uh, environment he must demonstrate a caring attitude towards his wife as well as to other people so the ideal father for adler cooperates to an equal footing with the child's mother in caring for the child and treating the child as a human being so a father's emotional detachment in many uh, or rather may influence the development of a, a, a warped sense of social interest, a feeling of neglect, and possibly a parasitic attachment to the mother. A child who experiences paternal detachment creates a goal of personal superiority rather than one uh, based on social interest. Now, the second error, paternal authoritarianism, may also lead to an unhealthy style of life. A child who sees the father as a tyrant learns to strive for power and personal superiority. Adler actually believed that the effects of the early social environment are extremely important. The relationship a child has with his mother and the father is so powerful that it smothers the effect of uh, heredity. Adler believed that at age or after uh, the age five, the effect of heredity becomes blurred by the powerful influence of a child's social um, environment. By that time, environmental forces have modified or shaped nearly every aspect of a child's personality. Adler uh, believed uh, that, that, that uh, social interest was a yardstick for measuring psychological health and is thus the sole, uh, the sole criterion of human values. To Adler, social interest is the only gauge to use in judging the worth of a person as uh, the barometer of, of normality and is the standard to be used in, every, in, in determining the usefulness of life. Um, to the degree that people possess social interest, they are psychologically mature. Uh, immature people lack Jamin Shafo and, and are self-centered and strive for personal power. So, so superiority over others uh, and, and, and uh, healthy individuals are genuinely concerned about people and have a goal of success that encompasses the well-being of all people and possibly animals too. <laughs> Social interest is not synonymous with charity and, uh, and unselfishness. Acts of philanthropy, and, and kindness may or may, may not be motivated by, by social interest. For example, a wealthy woman may regularly give large sums of money to the poor and uh, needy not because she feels a oneness with them, but quite the contrary because she wishes or rather she wishes to maintain a separateness from them. The gift implies you are inferior, I am superior, and this charity is proof of my superiority. Adler believed that the worth of all such acts can only be judged against the criterion of social interest. So Adler's fifth tenet is the self 
is rather is that the self-consistent personality structure develops into a person's style of life. Now, the, the style of life is that is is the term Adler used to refer to the flavor of a person's life. It includes a person's goal, self-concept, feelings for others, uh, and attitude towards the world. It's the product of the interaction of heredity, environment, and a person's creative power. So, a person's style of life is fairly well established by four, uh, or, or by age four or five. And after that time, all our actions revolve around our unified style of life. Although the final goal is singular, style of life need not be narrow or uh, rigid. Psychologically unhealthy individuals often lead rather inflexible, uh, inflexible lives that are marked by an inability to choose new ways of reacting to their environment. Adler and his followers analyzed person's style of life by comparing it to socially adjusted uh, human being. From that comparison, or from these comparisons, uh, rather, Adler felt he could distinguish four primary types of styles. Three of them, he said, uh, to be mistaken styles. So this includes the ruling type, which involves people or aggressive, dominating people who don't have much social interest or cultural perception. The getting type, which are dependent people who take rather uh, than give. And the avoiding type, uh, who uh, try to escape life's problem and take part in not uh, much socially constructive activity. Now, the fourth uh, style of, li of life by Adler is the socially useful type, uh, where people uh, who have this style of life have a great deal of social interest and, 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 and activity. So, people with a healthy, so, uh, healthy, socially useful style of life express their social interest through action. They actively struggle to solve what Adler regarded as the three major problems of life, neighborly love, sexual love, and occupation, and they do so through cooperation, personal courage, and a willingness to make contribution to the welfare of another. So, Adler believed that people with a socially useful style of life represents the highest form of humanity in the evolutionary process and are likely to populate the world of the future. So, Adler claimed that once a psychologist knows a person's style of life, it is possible to predict his future sometimes just on the basis of talking to him and having him answer questions. So, the final tenet of Adlerian theory is style of life is molded by people's creative power. So, each person, Adler believe, is empowered with the freedom to create his or her own style of life. Ultimately, all people are responsible for who they are and how they behave. Their creative power places them in control of their own lives is responsible for their final goal, determines their method of striving for that goal, and contributes to the development of social interest. In short, creative power makes each person a free individual. Creative power is a dynamic concept implying movement, and this movement is the most salient characteristic of life. All psychic life involves movement towards a goal movement with a direction. Adler used the interesting analogy which he called the law of the low do uh, doorway. If you are trying to walk through a doorway four feet high, four feet high, you have two basic choices. First, you can use your creative power to bend down as you approach the doorway, thereby successfully solving the problem. This is the manner in which the psychologically healthy individual solves most of life's problem. Conversely, if you bump your head and fall back, fall back, you must still solve the problem correctly or continue bumping your head. Neurotics 
often choose to bump their heads on the realities of life. When approaching the low doorway, you are neither compelled to stoop nor forced to bump your head. You have a creative power that permits you to follow either course or probably a third course. You may want to put explosive on the doorway and 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 and, and uh, make uh, and, and make explosion so that you can create a bigger doorway. Although that part was not uh, in the original text of Adler. So uh, a second example, or, or rather. For Adler, maladjustment is defined as uh, choosing behavior resulting in a lack of social interest or personal growth. Adler believed that misbehavior would take place when persons had uh, become discouraged or when positive attempts at good behaviors had failed to get the needed results. So Adler believed that people are what they make themselves. They uh, or rather the creative power and those humans within certain limits with the freedom to be either psychologically healthy or unhealthy and to follow either a useful or useless style of life. According to Adler, the one factor underlying all types of maladjustment is underdeveloped social interest. So, besides lacking social interest, neurotics tend to, number one, set their goals too high, number two, live in their own private worlds, and number three, have a rigid and dogmatic style of life. These three characteristics follow inevitably from a lack of social interest. In short, People become failures in life because they are over-concerned with themselves and care little about others. Maladjusted people set extravagant goals uh, as an overcompensation for exaggerated feelings of inferiority. These lofty goals lead to dogmatic behavior and the higher the goal, the more rigid the striving. To compensate for deeply rooted, rooted feelings of inadequacy and basic insecurities, these individuals narrow their perspective and strive compulsively and rigidly for unrealistic goals. So the exaggerated and unrealistic nature of neurotic goals set them apart from, community, uh, from the community of other people. They approach the problem of friendship, sex, and occupation from a personal angle that precludes successful solutions. So, we might ask, why do some people create maladjustment? Adler actually recognized three contributing factors, of e uh, any of which is sufficient to contribute to abnormality. The first is exaggerated physical deficiencies. People with exaggerated physical deficiencies sometimes develop exaggerated feelings of inferiority because they overcompensate for their inadequacy. They tend to be overly concerned with themselves and lack consideration for others. They feel as if they are living in enemy territory. They fear defeat more than they desire success and are convinced that life's major problems can be solved only in a selfish manner. The second is having a pampered style of life. Now, a pampered style of life lies at the heart of most neurosis. Pampered people have weak social interest but a strong desire to perpetuate their uh, pampered parasitic relationship. So they originally uh, had uh, uh, with one or both of their parents. So they expect others to look after them, overprotect them, and satisfy their needs. They are characterized by this extreme discouragement indecisiveness, oversensitivity, impatience, and exaggerated emotions, especially anxiety. They see the world with private vision and believe that they are entitled to be the first in everything. So uh, lastly, the third factor in maladjustment is neglected style of life. The third external factor contributing to maladjustment is neglect. Children who feel unloved and unwanted are likely to borrow heavily from
from these feelings in creating a neglected style of life. Neglect is a relatively co is a relative concept. No one feels totally neglected or completely unwanted. They, uh, the fact that uh, that a child survived infancy is a proof uh, that someone actually cared for the child and that the seed of social interest has been planted on them. So. Uh, Adler also believed that people create patterns of behaviors to protect their exaggerated sense of self, uh, uh, or rather self-esteem against public disgrace. These are actually similar, or, or these safeguarding tendencies are actually similar to Freud's defense mechanism. These protective factors or devices called safeguarding tendencies enable people to hide their inflated self-image and to maintain their current style of life. Adler's concept of the safeguarding tendency can be compared, again, was what I have said earlier, to Freud's concept, concept of defense mechanism. Freudian defense mechanism operate unconsciously to protect their ego against anxiety, whereas Adlerian safeguarding tendencies are largely conscious and shield a person's fragile self-esteem from public disgrace. Also, Freud's defense mechanism are common to everyone, but Adler discussed safeguarding tendencies only with reference to the construction of neurotic symptoms. So, uh, uh, for Freud, defense mechanisms are employed by everyone, but safeguarding tendencies for Adlers, for Adler rather, are only used. Uh, in, in relation to the construction of neurotic symptoms. And the first of these safeguarding tendencies is excuses. This is the most common of the safeguarding tendencies, which are typically expressed in the yes, but, or if only format. In the yes, but excuse, people first state that they claim they would like to do something that, sound good, that sounds good to others, then, uh, they will follow with an excuse. And uh, the if only statement is the same excuse phrased in a different way. If only my husband were more supportive, I would have advanced faster in my profession. If only the pandemic has not happened, my, I would have been uh, well uh, on my career. If only I did not have these physical deficiencies, I could compete successfully for a job. If only uh, I am able to wake up early, then I can uh, exercise. These excuses protect a weak but artificially inflated sense of self and deceive people into believing that they are more superior than they really are. Now, the second safeguarding tendency is aggression. Uh, this is another common safeguarding tendency, and Adler held that some people use aggression to safeguard their exaggerated superiority complex, that is to protect their fragile self-esteem. Safeguarding through aggression may take the form of, of depreciation, accusation, or self-accusation. Depreciation is the tendency to undervalue other people's achievement and to overvalue their own uh, achievement. This safeguarding tendency is evident in such aggressive people as criticism and gossips. So, uh, accusation, the second form of an aggressive safeguarding device, is the tendency to blame others for one's failure and to seek revenge, thereby safeguarding one's own tenuous self-esteem. The third form of, the, of, of neurotic aggression is self-accusation is marked by self-torture and guilt. Some people use self-torture, uh, self including masochism, depression, and suicide as means of hurting people who are close to them. Guilt is often uh, aggressive, self-accusatory -accus uh, behavior. L the last is withdrawal. People develop, uh, per or rather personality development, can be uh, halted when people run away from difficulties. Adler referred to these tendencies as withdrawal or safeguarding through distance. P some people unconsciously escape life's pro problem by setting up a distance between them and those problems. Adler recognized four 
four modes of safeguarding through withdrawal. First is moving backwards, second is standing still, third is hesitating, and, and, and fourth is constructing obstacle. So, so, so moving backwards is the tendency to safeguard one's fictional goal or, or of, of superiority by psychologically reverting to a more secure period of life. Remember Freud's regression? So, psychological distance can be created by standing still. This uh, uh, withdrawal tendency is similar to moving back, but in general, it's not as severe. People who stand still simply do not move uh, in any direction. So, so, they thus avoid all responsibilities by ensuring themselves against uh, any threat of failure so so uh, this or a rather procrastination could be a manifestation of what adler uh, referred to as standing still uh, the concept of impasse can also be referred to uh, adler's concept of standing still clearly uh, or rather closely related to standing still is hesitating some people hesitate or or or, or uh, some people hesitate when faced with difficult problems. Their procrastinations eventually give them the excuse, it's too late now. So, the least severe of the withdrawal safeguarding tendencies is constructing obstacles. Some people build a straw house to show that they can knock it down. By overcoming the obstacles, they protect their self-esteem and their prestige. Even if, or rather, if they fail, they... Uh, to, to hurdle the barrier, they can always resort to an excuse. So, in contrast to Freud, Adler believed that uh, the, 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 the psychic life of women is essentially the same as that of men and that a male-dominated society is not natural but rather an artificial product of historical development. Respect for Adler for this idea. So, so women get non-stop messages from 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 uh, from the media and, and and advertising that they should look and act a certain way if they want to be considered beautiful or desirable or successful. The media highlights a very specific version of being a woman that includes makeup, dresses, high heels, and a timid demeanor. There are also some jobs that are considered more appropriate for women, such as teaching, childcare, or even nursing. If you think about uh, the women in your life, they probably look a lot more diverse uh, and, and unique than the women you see on television. Women who participate in masculine protests are actively rebelling against uh, the position that modern society has constructed for them. To them, the stereotypes about women in the media are trying to force them into a very small box and they want to live in a bigger world uh, that is not ruled by inequality and inferiority. One way women express this by, is by choosing traditionally masculine careers like firefighting, military service, or even professional mixed martial arts. These women tend to feel more equal and powerful in their own lives and in many ways, they're slowly paving the way for all women. Men can also be influenced by the prominence of a masculine culture and participate in masculine protests themselves. In men, it typically manifests as a superiority complex which is uh, used to hide feelings of inferiority by grandois, uh, uh, behaviors of, of being better and superior to others. It's the usage of I am a better than you mentality in order to hide the unpleasantness uh, or the unpleasant feelings of emotional distress or feeling inferior and inadequate. So lastly, let's talk about Adler's concept of humanity. Adler believed that people are basically self-determined and that they shape their personalities from uh, from the meaning they give their uh, they give to their experiences, uh, the building material of personalities provided by heredity and, and, and environment, but the creative power shapes 
these materials and put it to good use. Adler frequently emphasized that the use uh, that the people make of their ability this is more important than the quantity of those abilities. Heredity endows people with certain abilities and, and, and environment gives them some opportunities to enhance those abilities, but we are ultimately responsible for the use uh, they make uh, of these abilities. So Adler also believed that people in people's interpretation rather, uh, of experiences are more important than the act than the experience themselves. Neither the past nor the future determines present behavior. Instead, people are motivated by their present perception of the past and their present expectations of the future. So these perceptions do not necessarily uh, correspond with reality and as Adler stated meanings are not determined by situations but we determine ourselves uh, by the meanings we give the situation people are forward moving motivated by future goals rather than by innate instincts of, of causal forces these future goals are often rigid and unrealistic but people's personal freedom all, all uh, allows them to reshape their goal and thereby change their lives. People create their personalities and are capable of altering them by learning new ideas and attitudes. These attitudes encompass an understanding that change can happen, that no other person or circumstance is responsible for what a person is, and that the personal growth must be subordinated uh, to social interest. Although our final goal is relatively fixed during early childhood, we remain free to change our style of life at any time. Because the goal is, is fictional and unconscious, we can set and pursue temporary goals. These momentary goals are not rigidly uh, uh, circums circumscribed by the, by, by, by the final goal but are created uh, by us merely as partial solutions. Adler expressed the, this idea as follows. We must understand that the reactions of the human soul are not final and absolute. Every response is but a partial response, valid, temporary, but in no way to be considered a final solution of a problem. In other words, even though our final goals is set during childhood, we are capable of change at any point in life. However, Adler maintained that not all our choices are conscious and that style of life is created through both conscious and unconscious choices. Adler believed that ultimately people are responsible for their own personalities. People's creative power is capable of transforming feelings of inadequacy to either social interest or into self-centered goals of personal superiority. This capacity means that people remain free to choose between psychological health and neuroticism. Adler regarded self-centeredness as path uh, or rather as pathologically as pathological and established social interest as the standard of psychological maturity. For him, healthy people have high levels of social interest, but throughout their lives, they remain free to accept or reject normality and become uh, what they will. So, on the six dimensions of the concept of humanity listed in the first video of this course, we rate Adler very high on free choice and optimism, very low on causality and, and, and leaning towards teleolo teleology, uh, moderate on unconscious uh, influences of, of personality and behavior, high on social factors, and on the uniqueness of individuals. In summary, Adler held that people are self-determining uh, social creatures forward moving and motivated by present fictions to strive towards perfection for themselves and society. So, this ends our lesson for today. My name is Dex Kamitan and thank you for watching.